Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you enjoyed Anna Collard's session. Um, I found it also quite fascinating to see what is going on. Um, now for my session this afternoon, I'm going to talk about running um, uh, OpenText Retain in the cloud. Now, I will first just give you some brief overview of what OpenText Retain is about, because it's quite important for those of you who do not know yet. Um, and then I will take you through all the steps that's necessary um, um, in terms of running OpenText Retain in the cloud, why people want to run it in the cloud, um, and the whole process that you will need to go through to run it in the cloud. Just take note that the Q&A and the chat is open. So if you need to ask any questions, you are welcome to do so. Okay, Open Text Retain um, is used for enterprise messaging archiving. It is something that um, support um, both groupwise, Microsoft Exchange, and, and also Exchange Online in Windows 365 as an archiving platform. Um, it's very comprehensive um, in terms of its capabilities. Um, we have been using it now for quite more than a few, uh, well, at least since the, uh, the mid-2000s when it was uh, released the first time. Um, so you can imagine that something like a retained system can grow quite big in size over time, um, depending on your archive policies. So you may say that over time you want to start to remove emails from the system of the certain age. Um, we actually make use of it um, for archiving all our communications. Um, and we do not age the information because it's uh, um, uh, we quite often use it as a inf information repository to to find um, documents or technical information that we may have written 20 years ago and then we still have the option of actually accessing it in retain if it's nowhere else available um, i think one of the reasons why people may want to run it in the cloud um, Quite often, um, depending on your size of the organization, your on-premise systems will always require hardware upgrades, in, especially in terms of storage. Um, your retained storage will obviously just keep on growing over time, unless you age your information and say anything older than seven or 10 years may be removed from the archive. Um, but in most cases, I've seen customers keeping all the information on their email archive system. So in some of our customer cases, we're sitting with clients with like a 90 terabyte retained archive, that type of environment uh, where they are very particular about protecting the information that is um, stored within that retained system. But obviously, um, as time goes by, it will just keep on growing and then you need to do constant hardware upgrades. Um, the biggest challenges come when there's major operating system updates. We need to move to a uh, different operating system or a different version of the operating system. It can be quite um, challenging to, to uh, achieve that. Um, when you, especially in the public sector, in government, um, procurement processes um, can often be quite lengthy. Um, if you don't monitor the growth of your, uh, of the retained storage, um, uh, you may suddenly uh, start to run out of storage. Um, it, uh, because people will check the storage and say, okay, I've got, still, I've got like 30% of storage available. What they forget is that going higher than 70% consumption of your storage is not good for any kind of system. And um, you will see uh, other things may start to fail, especially if you've got very large indexes and it's no longer enough space to perform index maintenance or run the backup capabilities, components of the indexes, etc. 
and then all of a sudden the whole system runs out of space. Now you need to order new hardware and you may sit with a six week or something. In some cases I've seen up to six month long procurement processes to procure additional um, storage uh, for your system. And that leads to long periods of non-compliance that you actually not archiving the mail and people's mailboxes start to grow significantly in size. Um, so there are all these kind of, of challenges that you may face when you're running um, uh, retain uh, on an on-premise type of um, environment. Now, the minute you move a retained server to a cloud type of environment, that is where the elasticity in the cloud removes these obstacles. Yes, uh, when you create a compute instance on AWS or on the Azure platform, you always attach a certain size storage to your um, operating system. Um, but that is purely for the operating system and maybe the place where you're going to run the database. Um, that does, uh, that still basically transfers the um, limitations of uh, restricted data storage and that you need to go through a certain um, configuration change to increase that storage. But both um, your Azure platform and AWS have got um, a blob-based storage um, mechanisms, either block-based or on the uh, Microsoft Azure site, a blob-based storage uh, mechanism. And these storage um, systems, you don't really know what the maximum size is. In fact, uh, quite, uh, uh, quite often the, the maximum size of these um, storage instances is, can go up to a couple of petabytes. You only, you only get charged for the amount of storage you actually consume. And especially when you run Retain on a SUSE Linux platform, these um, storage um, um, systems can be mounted as, as storage, as a file system on your Linux server so that the Retain still thinks it's standard storage where it is storing its data. Where in fact, you are storing it either on S3 storage or on the uh, blob storage on the uh, Azure side. And um, that means it will only, you only will get built for the actual amount of storage you use. And it will can then just continue to grow until um, you're probably not using Retain anymore, or um, I don't think you will easily reach a petabytes of storage when it comes to um, email archiving but um, you almost have like unlimited storage in that case. Now, one of the things that you also need to understand is the typical costs of running um, Retain in the cloud. Um, and what I've done here was to take quite a large environment um, uh, where we talk about um, 5,000 users um, or mailboxes with an average of around two terabyte of um, mail data that needs to be archived and an initial starting point of around 90 terabytes of data that will be stored in the cloud. So obviously this is quite a large environment. So for such an environment, we will um, set up um, the the server requirements um, to run the index server and application server to run at least 64 gigs of RAM with eight CPU cores. And in a case like this, we will use um, SSD storage for the operating system and we will mount the indexes and the databases on also on SSD storage. For the um, retain um, data, excluding the indexes, we will use the blob storage on Azure and on uh, or on AWS, we will use the S3 infrequent access storage, which is one of the 
cheaper options, even though S3 storage is already quite cheap. Um, the AWS um, infrequent access storage is even cheaper because it's not as if each and every item gets accessed all the time. Um, so you don't need to go for the standard S3 storage. You can actually go for the infrequent access storage and it will actually work pretty much uh, the same with uh, limited um, end users won't really notice the difference. Now, one of the things that you may want to also know is what the estimated costs will be. Now, this is where both Azure and AWS is quite quite powerful, and uh, in uh, you can give them a couple of input parameters, um, and it will create you some estimations of more or less how much this will cost you on a monthly basis. Um, um, we've just used the standard um, uh, monthly um, subscription charges uh, without um, any um, upfront commitments um, where you can up, uh, commit for a one year or a two or a three year period. Um, so um, in the South African RAND terms, um, for a system like that, more or less it will work out to around about 54,000 Rand per month, excluding VAT um, on the Microsoft Azure side and on the Amazon AWS side, um, you can see it is um, uh, quite um, almost a fifth cheaper. Um, it, is, it works out to around about 44,000 Rand per month for a system like that. Obviously, if you've got a much smaller type of environment, um, it will cost you a lot less than that. The one thing that you do need to take into account, and that and I haven't calculated that cost um, for this exercise, um, but that is for the initial data migration from your on-premises system to the, um, uh, uh, the service that you're going to run in the cloud. Now, a Microsoft starts the billing from your first byte that you transfer. So you may end up paying also quite a large sum initially for your initial data migration. So just be aware of that when you're running on the Azure platform. On AWS, there are different free tier thresholds depending on what type of um, um, compute service um, and how you structured your um, virtual private cloud. Um, they've got certain free uh, tier thresholds. There's even, um, depending if you've got a very small environment and you're not going to sit with these um, uh, large um, uh, server requirements, you can run a very small compute EC2 instance on the AWS side. Then if you're a new AWS client, um, in some cases, your first 12 months, they don't even charge you for it. Um, and, and then obviously from the second year onwards, you will start to incur a charge. So there's, there's always, a, 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 for most of the services within um, AWS, there's always a free tier threshold. Um, I know because NetCB is also running quite a number of services on AWS as a customer, not as a partner, but as a customer. So we pay for those services. And um, uh, we can see our data transfers at the moment are still below a threshold, so we don't even get billed for the data transfers um, um, into the cloud at the moment because we're still below the threshold. But we are a small organization, so um, we didn't trigger the billing uh, on those uh, components. Now, obviously, there's a couple of things that you need to do before you can start with something like this. Um, the first, first decision that you need to make is decide which cloud port platform you want to use. Um, um, it will always be up between Azure or AWS. Um, um, I'm not going to be funny, but I do have a preference for AWS. <laughs> but um, we do 
run on Azure as well. Um, in fact, um, uh, the, the server that we tested this whole environment with was actually done on the Azure platform. Um, because we wanted to see how well we can apply um, the principles of the well-architected framework and the architecting principles um, from AWS within um, Azure. And it was quite, quite um, successful in that case. Um, obviously, once you've now decided uh, which platform you're going to use, um, uh, if you're not already a Microsoft uh, client on their Azure site, then obviously you will need to register for an account. And uh, remember, they will only start billing you uh, once you start consuming services. Um, on both platforms, there's always a cost calculator. Use those cost calculators to first identify what will be the least cost option for you to use. You can model different scenarios. You can adjust the memory requirements, the storage requirements, or even the initial storage requirements. Um, but base, do not um, think, I anticipate in a year from now, my, oh, my, my root file system may consume 30 gigs in size. Um, but initially, when I install the operating system, I'm only using 10 gigabyte in size. There's no reason for you to then pay for 30 gigs when you're only using 10 gigabytes. gigabytes. Um, obviously, you need to make sure that you have enough um, space on the file system as required for lock rotation and all these other type of temporary files that will also consume space. But obviously, you will have that information already from your existing retail environment to understand exactly how much space you are already consuming on an operational perspective on your um, uh, server that you want to move um, into the cloud. Now, once you've now decided on your platform, um, you've decided what costing model you're going to follow, at that point in time, you are ready to establish your own virtual private cloud, quite often referred to as a VPC. And once you start to set up your own virtual private cloud, within that virtual private cloud, I'm not going to go into the details of setting up a virtual private cloud, because that's not really part of this session. <laughs> but within a virtual private cloud, you will configure the necessary um, internet gateway access points. You will create the necessary customer gateway. You will also configure a site-to-site -site VPN. So because you want to allow the retained server not to run via the public internet. So it's far better to set up an IPsec tunnel between your VPC in the cloud as well as your on-premise network. That means that on a private network level, you will communicate to your private network that is sitting in the cloud. And you do not break out onto the internet and expose you to possible other vulnerabilities while transferring this data. Because quite often, you may still have your group I system on premise, and the retained workers will need to communicate directly with your group I system. And it is far better to have that run via a private VPN tunnel communicating with your on-premises system. That way, you are always ensured of a higher level of security. Um, and uh, you know that the firewall on, the, um, uh, on your VPC side and the firewall that you have on the on-premise, the, on um, you what we refer to, will refer to as the customer gateway. And then you will have um, your, um, uh, your internet or your VPN gateway on the um, cloud side, on the VPC side. And those two will establish that um, communication. You will obviously still apply additional firewall rules to only allow communication across certain ports. 
depending on your retain configuration and how it needs to, the workers will need to communicate um, with your um, group eyes or um, messaging platform, whether it's exchange or exchange online. Now, once you have established the communication, you've made sure that you can you can actually be on your local network and you can ping um, certain services on your uh, VPC site. Um, and then you know the communication is active. Then it's time to start to set up um, the systems on the um, on your cloud provider. Now there is two two slightly different approaches between the two systems um, from Azure versus AWS. Um, the first thing that you will do is to select your hot, the hardware suitable for your environment, obviously based on your costing exercise that you've gone through. So make sure that you make the selection based on what you've decided. Um, both environments uh, provide uh, images for um, SUSE Linux um, Enterprise um, 15. Um, SP4 and 5, so as well as um, what we refer to on the AWS side, we refer to that as the Amazon um, AMI's um, machine images uh, short, um, and we normally refer to that as an AMI. There is one thing though that um, um, is quite easy to perform to do on the AWS side. Um, is uh, if your existing server you want to migrate is already a VMware um, virtual machine, you can take your current VMDK file and place it on an S3 storage on AWS. And then AWS can import that VMDK file, and that, that will then allow you to just fire up your virtual machine on AWS as an EC2 instance, and then you can make the necessary configurations, and then the migration of the data um, from an on-premise system will actually then not be required, but that really depends on how large your your storage will be on 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 your on premise system, um, uh, but that is an alternative way of also going uh, about this. On the Azure side, um, you will quite often in a very large environment, you will quite often install two servers: so a dedicated database server and a dedicated application and index server. Um, in uh, small environments um, for archiving, it's quite often a single type of server. Um, on AWS though, um, even in, if it's a very large system, you have the option to create a MariaDB endpoint on the Amazon RDS or Amazon Aurora database platform. Now, Amazon RDS, is like a database as a service, and then they provide you with a MariaDB interface for your application to communicate with and then create the database tables, the database and the database tables on that platform. Um, the Amazon um, Aurora database, on the other hand, you can do a similar thing um, also with a MariaDB interface, but Aurora is slightly more expensive depending on the number of transactions, because it will, it's calculated again, based on the number of transactions, database transactions that will be conducted. Um, and then obviously if you're below, I think it's a million transactions per month, it's again free. Um, then your um, Aurora database uh, can provide up to a, a sub millisecond response time. So you may see uh, on the AWS side, and uh, when you make use of either the Amazon RDS and especially the Amazon Aurora platform, you may see a, a significant improvement in database responsiveness. 
because a, a retained database can grow quite large. I've got clients with um, retained databases nearing 10 terabytes in size on MariaDB now, um, which is pretty large, where we sit uh, on almost half a billion records um, within the database. Another, the next step um, will be to also, once you've set up your Linux servers, etc., is now to add the actual message archive storage. On both systems, you will create what we call a blob storage endpoint. Now, that blob storage endpoint um, is what will be mounted um, at the end of the day on your Linux server. On the um, AWS side, we will create an AWS 3 storage endpoint. Um, what we also do is that we add an additional set of SSD storage to specifically run the indexes so that indexes can perform extremely fast on SSD storage. And that we will do on both sides, whether it's Azure or AWS. And then we will also mount the blob storage using the blob fuse drivers on SUSE Linux on the Azure side. And on the AWS side, um, there's uh, drivers that we um, quickly install um, from AWS to mount S3 storage as a file system. So that Linux will see it as a standard file system and uh, you'll be able to write um, data and read data from those file systems. The only difference on the Azure side is you need to create at least around about a 10 terabyte storage. Well, this is if we're talking about a nine terabyte um, uh, mail storage to create a temp storage that BlobFuse is actually the drivers are actually using during the process of writing and reading to the blob storage. It's almost as if it's has got like an interim phase, although the file system will see it as if you're writing directly to the blob storage. It is handled by the drivers itself directly. The next step is um, to, let me see what the time is, uh, doing fast. Okay, I've got five minutes left, okay. Now right, to use the provided um, retain server migration tools, there's a little tool within uh, retain um, that allows us to facilitate the migration that ensures that all the ownership of the data is um, properly maintained, so the correct, um, um, Data, the data is written to the correct locations on the destination server um, and the configuration files of the original system is also written to the correct locations. Especially things like um, if you've been using AES encryption on your retained storage, it is important that those encryption keys are also transferred to, to the new destination. Now, people always ask me now, how long will it take to do this migration? And I always say, how long is this piece of string? Um, it really is going to depend on your network bandwidth to the cloud provider and the size of your existing retained storage. Those are the two factors that will determine how fast the data will be migrated. Um, if you have 90 terabytes of storage and you've got a one gigabyte um, link, um, and remember we're moving small files. So small files always take a little bit longer to move than large files. So you can do a couple of spot checks, do a calculation how long it's taken to copy those files and then estimate how long it will take. But in many cases, I can tell you it, um, depending on your bandwidth, it can take from a week to two weeks to, in some cases, even a month um, to uh, migrate very large um, amounts of data. 
Now, once the entire migration has um, completed, um, then um, it is time now to make sure that retain is reconfigured. So the next steps that you do is to um, start up retain, uh, log on to the retain console, and then immediately make changes to the network configuration information. Um, you'll have to generate new worker configuration files and import them again on your worker so that it knows exactly to which retain server to communicate with. And then you can start your archiving jobs again. And hopefully that uh, there wasn't enough time that expired during the migration period um, for you to have small retain archiving jobs. So that is basically, in essence, um, what it takes to migrate your information. Now, um, I see I'm very, almost out of time. Um, I actually wanted to do a quick demo for you that you can see what it looks like uh, running in the cloud. Um, I am having an open source session tomorrow, and I'm going to talk about um, PFSense as a as a as a firewall. Um, and how you, that can be used to facilitate these IPsec tunnels to AWS and uh, Azure. So I will then, um, so if you really want to see an actual retained server running in the cloud, um, please join that session then, uh, because I'm actually going to use that configuration to, to demonstrate exactly how that, that works. But if I just quickly can show you what is already running, um, within our cloud environment. Um, you can see we have a, um, a NetCD production. This is Azure, by the way, um, this retained server. I'm just going to zoom in a bit to make sure that the text is a little bit bigger. Uh, we're running a server with 16 gigs of RAM, four virtual CPUs. Um, it does not have a public IP address because we're not exposing this um, server to the public internet. Um, the uh, server name is uh, a test because it is only a testing environment. After this conference, I'm shutting it down because Microsoft really charges us a lot for this. Um, uh, I can obviously add additional availability and scaling by adding additional zones to run it in. Um, it, the private IP address is this, and you'll see tomorrow how I can ping this um, private IP address even here from my VPN where I'm sitting at home. Um, so this is basically the configuration that we're using at the moment for the virtual machine running on the Azure platform. Um, if I quickly go to the home side, um, if I look at all my resources, you can see there's the BlobFuse temp storage that I'm using. Um, um, this is um, some stuff that we're doing for GWVC at the moment. Um, there's, a, a, a IP, there's a public IP address for that we can use, but I have not attached it. This is our network uh, security group. For every um, subnet you will create, you will actually create a network security group. Um, and a couple of other items. Um, this is a network interface card. Um, there's a, another disk that we are using. Um, and here's the um, uh, retained storage that we're running um, on the system. So you can see this is a blob sto uh, um, a storage that is actually running on the system at the moment. Oh, I forgot to move it across to this side. <laughs> Here you can see the actual um, virtual server that is sitting in, in the cloud. Let me quickly jump back here. If I go to my virtual machines, there's the one virtual machine it's kind of currently running. And I can also, don't worry, that issue only came up yesterday. I don't know why it's not removing the error. There's actually no fault on the server at the moment. Um, so it's a relatively small virtual server. Um, and um, there's a private IP address and it's running in our production network on the Azure platform. Let's see if there were any questions that were asked. No questions. 
Okay. So tomorrow's session, you will see how we actually connect this to our um, uh, through the PFSense firewall session in the open source session because PFSense is an open source firewall and it is a very good um, type of system um, to manage these type of connections without paying uh, arm and leg to establish these type of secure connections. And I thank you very much for joining me on this session.